Um, thanks for joining and, and thanks to Market Links for the invitation uh, to, to be here and, and moderate this amazing panel this morning. <laughs> Um, so I'm Rebecca Rouse. I'm the team lead for the digital financial services team at USAID. Um, our practice fosters the development of open, inclusive, and secure digital finance ecosystems and economies worldwide. Digital finance has the ability to provide better and cheaper access to financial services, as well as new types of products and innovations that meet the needs of underserved segments and unlock economic opportunities. But in order for that potential to be realized, uh, we recognize that there needs to be level playing fields to promote innovation so that consumers can also get the best options possible and can exercise choice. This isn't just about new innovations and creating no new opportunities either. This is a necessity to protect consumers, this level playing field. More and more people and businesses are doing business online and using digital tools, so it affects everyone and, and the entire economy. So for that reason, it's a priority for USAID's digital finance team and crucial to our development and humanitarian objectives to support financial systems and policies that increase transparency and open inclusive markets. The nature of new innovations in DFS in the digital economy, including the global, the global nature, nature of, of these firms that are playing in this space, present new challenges for policymakers globally, both in the US and, and, and abroad. And now more than ever, it's important to share experiences and support cooperation across jurisdictions. That's why USAID teamed up with the US Federal, Tra uh, Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, to launch the Trust and Competition in Digital Economies Initiative. This program was launched in 2022 and leverages the exp expertise and convening power of the FTC to share US experiences and support government authorities in Africa to adopt and implement policy, legal, regulatory, and enforcement frameworks that protect consumers and competition. I was just in Cameroon this month with an FTC colleague meeting with, with regulators and really the, the, the quality of these exchanges, um, these bilateral exchanges that we're experiencing is incredible because we're all facing these same challenges with the growth of the global economy. And so the ability to share approaches and ideas is essential to ensuring that we are all well equipped to build an ecosystem that's pro-competition and pro-consumer. So this is why I'm delighted to participate in today's webinar and discuss these challenges with, with you all, participants in a wider audience and with our panelists. So I'm looking forward to the conversation in the Q&A section. Um, but first, let me walk you through the structure of the panel. Um, first, we'll hear from Musa Traore and Paul Nelson on USAID's approach to promoting fair competition in international development practice. Then we'll hear from our colleague Wangombe Karayuki about the unique challenges facing countries in Africa related to the rapid growth and success of digital financial services, um, based in part on his experience leading the development of Kenya's Competition Act. And then finally, we will hear from Molly Askin at the US Federal Trade Commission about how her team works with counterpart authorities across the African continent and how experiences from the US can help emerging market regulators. Um, so with that, I don't wanna uh, wait any longer. Let's turn it over to the panelists. Um, our first uh, presenter, is uh, my colleague Musa Traore. He's the Senior Business Enabling Environment Advisor and Acting Lead for entrepreneurial, the Entrepreneurial Environment Team at the USA Bureau for Inclusive Growth, Partnerships and Innovations Center for Economics and Market Development. Um, he supports agency, the agency's policy development, programming, monitoring, and learning for the private sector development. Um, and he's also the co-author, along with Paul Nelson, who you'll hear from later, um, on, uh, he's the co-author of a recent technical brief promoting fair competition in the digital economy. So Musa, let me turn it over to you for your presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Um, I wanna make sure that my presentation is showing. Um, I'm in apologies to everyone because I'm across different screens. And so right now I can't see the room, but I just wanna make That's sure good. that everyone can hear. It can hear me and see the presentation. Yep, looks great. Perfect. Uh, so thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Rebecca, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those joining us, uh, depending on where they're joining from. Uh, today, Paul and I have the pleasure of presenting the technical brief we developed and published together a little over a year ago. Um, to start, I want to give credit where it's due and provide a little background on how the brief came to be. Uh, huge kudos to Paul for doing the foundational work and initiating the conversations that led to the development of the brief. Uh, from the day that Paul and I met, uh, he's been a strong advocate of USAID and other development partners uh, work to, meaningful, to more meaningfully improve uh, competition and consumer protection in our partner countries. 
Uh, we initially connected on competition policy and consumer protection in the context of my role as a manager of USAID's inter interagency agreement with the US Federal Trade Commission, which provides direct technical assistance to USAID partner countries to strengthen their competition policy and consumer protection environment. Paul's been uh, a longstanding champion of the subject of FTC USAID collaboration, and in his former role at USAID, he initiated the FTC implemented activity to build trust and competition in digital economies across Africa, which you'll hear more about from our FTC colleague, Molly Askin, in a few minutes. Um, the suite of activities, um, USAID's digital finance team, so Paul's former team and now Rebecca's team, and my team, which focuses broadly on the business environment, support became the basis for development of this guide on how to advance competition in consumer protection and digital economies uh, in developing contexts. Now let's delve into the substance of today's discussion. Uh, the basic premise behind our brief is that robust, fair competition is critical for all sectors of the economy to thrive, and the digital economy is no exception. Uh, to start, let's establish a definition for the digital economy. Uh, our brief relies on the USA Digital Strategies definition, which notes that digital economy refers to the use of digital and internet infrastructure by individuals, businesses, and government to interact with each other, engage in economic activity, and access both digital and non-digital goods and services. As the ecosystem supporting it matures, the digital economy might grow to encompass all sectors of the economy. A transformation driven by both the rise of new services and entrance, as well as backward linkages um, with the traditional pre-digital economy. A diverse array of technologies and platforms facilitate activity in the digital economy. However, much activity relies in some measure on the internet, mobile phones, digital data, and digital payments. On the next slide, we'll discuss why developing competition in the digital economy matters. Essentially, as more firms and people do business online and through digital means, competition in the digital economy is integral to achieving an inclusive, open, and secure digital ecosystem. However, the regulations that safeguard competition and ensure the benefits of the digital economy accrue to all individuals and businesses alike are lacking in many emerging markets and developing economies. This is the reason we, as development partners, must support the efforts of our partner countries, their private sector, and civil society to strengthen competition. First, competition has economic, social, and governance benefits when too much market power is concentrated in one or few firms, this concentration can confer on the firm or group of firms notable political power that may undermine the integrity of regulatory bodies, democratic norms, and meaningful representation of communities that lack wealth or political connections. Second, in the absence of robust competition, powerful market incumbents are not incentivized to improve their services. They maintain their power by influencing the development of policies that insulate them from open competition from local independent entrepreneurs and or international firms seeking to offer new and better services in the economy. This often leads to the market hegemon to corrupt practices or coercive action to secure favorable policies or avoid oversight. Number three. When firms are made to compete, they're more likely to innovate and deliver quality services to the economy. This sort of competition is important because it may contribute to a market system that provides greater economic mobility by ensuring small firms have pathways for growth and improves household resilience. Over time, this may also shrink inequality, improve the responsiveness of public institutions to non-politically connected firms and households, and broaden the sense of inclusion and agency felt by underrepresented communities, and ultimately bolster economic growth. Fourth, collusive and monopolistic practices exist in analog and digital economies alike. However, addressing antitrust issues in the digital economy presents its own set of unique challenges. For example, many firms in the digital economy operate globally, which can make investigations into illegal conduct difficult, slow, 
are impossible if cross-border mechanisms for coordination and information sharing among authorities are inexistent or inadequate. Additionally, many of these practices, when executed by firms using sophisticated technologies or algorithms, may be difficult or imposed for authorities, civil society watchdogs, or competitors, um, may, or may be impossible for authorities, civil society watchdogs, or competitors to detect and respond to, to, to before irreversible harm occurs. And finally, the digital economy's pace of evolution and dynamics of investment and innovation may outstrip the availability of the ability of authorities to respond quickly before anti-competitive effects set in. Lastly, consumer protection is equally important in developing economies. Consumer protection policies generally limit the behavior of firms regardless of their size. Protections for consumers in the digital economy commonly relate to data protection, false advertising, data-enabled discrimination, scams, and fraud. As with competition policies, authorities have developed consumer protection frameworks that apply to conduct across industries, and the digital age has raised the question of how these frameworks need to be adapted to ensure consumers are not exposed to harm, to harm unnecessarily. On the next slide, we'll discuss the roadmap for development activities focused on improving competition in the digital economy. So as we continue the discussion, it's important to acknowledge the influence the international development community might have on uh, the degree and quality of competition. Regardless of whether influence on competition is a conscious choice, development uh, partners may influence local, co local competitiveness by uh, helping to develop regulations that determine which firms under what circumstances can enter a market, providing capital or financing to startups or mentorship to promising digital entrepreneurs, procuring digital services from information technology vendors or operational needs, and forming partnerships with uh, individual firms in the digital economy. As we reflect on what development partners might do to promote competition, we'll look at the four phases and planning activities that focus on competition in the digital economy. And these are understanding, scoping, designing, and implementing. First, it's important to understand the digital economy your activity is operating in. If you don't, your program might end up having a negative effect on competition, such as by reinforcing a firm's local monopoly. To guide development partners in understanding the digital economy and identify the competitive dynamics, our brief points to informative assessment tools. The brief identifies four tools you might use to better understand the competition dynamics in the country you're working in. Owing to limited time, I won't give you an overview of each tool. You can refer to the brief for more information on each. Instead, I'll, I'll give you an example from USAID's digital, digital economy econ, ecosystem country assessment framework, which is called the DECA for short. Uh, the DECA provides some high level insights that enable development partners to scope out programming that might address targeted issues within the digital economy. The DECA framework has three parts, including digital infrastructure and adoption, uh, digital society rights and governance um, and digital economy. Now, as a practical example, look, let's look at how the 2020 USA DECA for Kenya identified competition issues in the digital economy. The DECA shows that Safaricom, the lead holder of market shares for mobile subscriptions in Kenya, is a marketplace juggernaut uh, whose market stature dwarfs competitors. More specifically, the assessment showed that Safaricom consistently held more than two thirds of the market share of mobile subscriptions from 2015 to 19. And the telecom partly owes its dominance to M-Pesa, its mobile money payment service. Use of M-Pesa is so ubiquitous that it has made it difficult for other mobile network operators to penetrate the digital economy in the way Safaricom has. And the report found that with M-Pesa mobile money platform um, linked to almost all payment systems across Kenya, technology companies can easily build on Safaricom's business model, but new innovation and competition outside of this is largely disincentivized. The assessment report goes on to provide recommendations for addressing the challenges resulting from Safaricom's market power. These types of insights about market dynamics made possible through robust assessments like the DECA, help practitioners understand the nature of competition challenges and make, in, 
and make informed decisions about how to best uh, support reforms intended to diversify and grow the digital economy. The brief also provides some market and enabling environment focused questions you might introduce into an assessment to better understand whether and how competition is constraining private sector development. It also provides some guidance for a systems based analytical approach to understanding whether competition is at the root of these constraints. On the next slide, we'll delve into the second phase scoping out. And sorry if I'm looking away, I have the, the PowerPoint that is that you're seeing on a different monitor. Um, once you have an understanding of the context, it's important to identify the stakeholders and their relationships to each other. This slide displays some of the stakeholders you might scope out. Of note here is the diversity of the stakeholders. Understanding dynamics between stakeholders will empower you to be more effective in crafting interventions that can tap into local resources and incentives to influence the market system. And scoping out may give rise to a lot of political economy questions and considerations. For instance, in countries where governance institutions are weak or poorly resourced, certain firms can use political influence to undermine the degree, integrity, or independence of regulatory oversight and competition policy enforcement. In some, in some cases, firms may also resort to collusion or other corrupt, corrupt practices, whether at the local, regional, or national levels. Your approach to understanding these dynamics in the digital economy or in a particular subset of it should reflect your circumstances. The brief identifies three analytical tools you can use to better understand market dynamics for the sake of, but for the sake of time, we won't delve into those, but I invite you to look at the brief uh, for these resources. On the next slide, we'll talk through design activities um, and we'll provide a practical example from USAID's collaboration with Federal Trade Commission as pre as um, as uh, what you'll hear from uh, from Molly asking in a little bit um, in, in greater detail. And now I have the pleasure of handing the mic over to the person who started this whole effort, um, who's going to walk you through the next two phases. Um, over to you, Paul. Thanks, Melissa, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, everyone. First, uh, I should flag that I had a power outage here a minute ago, so if I suddenly stop uh, talking, um, you might hear Musa again to uh, complete the session before we hand it off to the other panelists. Um, and I should also mention I'm uh, now with the U.S. State Department, but anything that I discuss today is based on uh, work that I did while at USCID and doesn't necessarily reflect the views of the, of the U.S. State Department. Um, so, Musa gave a great summary of the context that we need to understand in order to ensure that we are promoting the kinds of development outcomes or economic outcomes that we want to see in the digital economy. Um, and to have a reasonable chance of facilitating the systems change that uh, most of us are trying to achieve, we want to, uh, you know, think through theories of change. Uh, identifying problems, um, understanding pathways to change or viable partners for facilitating that change. Um, and that kind of analysis is really important. Let me just give you a few quick examples. Um, so, one, let's say that you are concerned about cybersecurity in the country that you are working in or in the sector that you are working in. Um, in many places, uh, there are reports regarding cybersecurity vulnerabilities within service providers. People have uh, bank accounts that they access online. They're very nervous about having data getting leaked or having uh, scammers access data that can be used to either drain their bank accounts or steal their identity. So, one question to ask is why do those cybersecurity vulnerabilities persist? What is the origin of the problem? In some cases, it might be due to limited provider level cyber, cyber capacity. That is a common constraint on these issues. Sometimes it's also due to limited end user digital literacy. And so frequently you see programs focused on improving digital hygiene of end users so they know how to better protect their PIN or their password or not click on infected links. But there might also be a market incentives issue to that particular issue. If you're focused on promoting uh, cyber resilience and cybersecurity in the digital economy, um, sometimes the use of good practices within industry 
is driven by whether they have an incentive, a competitive incentive to use good practices. If a firm does not have competitors that uh, can offer a better, potentially more secure product based on industry standards or industry best practices, they might not necessarily invest as much as they would otherwise to ensure their products are safe for end users. Let me give you another example. Some of you might be looking at the digital economy from a gender lens or thinking about artificial intelligence and promoting uh, you know, uh, innovation and growth within the AI landscape from a development perspective. Let's say you hope to promote gender, equal gender equality and you know that many people are discriminated against in hiring due to their gender or because they are women. Something that has come up in, in the digital economy is reports of algorithmic bias. For example, job platforms where people are met, where uh, applicants are matched with potential jobs that they can then apply for, uh, occasionally discriminate, and oftentimes this is unintentional, but occasionally discriminate against uh, women for one reason or another. Now, why does that bias occur? Is it because the platform is itself uh, intentionally trying to discriminate against uh, one particular gender? That's always a possibility. Or is it because the platform lacks um, adequate incentives to improve its data quality, to audit its algorithms, to ensure that they are not inadvertently um, magnifying or exacerbating pre-existing gender inequality? Or is it because they don't have adequate competitive incentives to set metrics that don't reinforce inequality? The reason why I'm giving you these concrete examples is to is to point out that many uh, in, in many cases, development practitioners might be thinking about ways to promote one growth or development in one aspect of the digital economy and forget that competitive dynamics in the industry might actually contribute to problems that they are observing or be a way for the for a development program or partnership or activity to to address the issue that they are seeing, even if they might not think of it from a competitive lens. So uh, a couple of years ago, we were observing some of the issues uh, in the digital economy in uh, across the African continent. And um, one of the things that we, uh, we identified was a, a, a general lack of capacity, in some cases, lack of, uh, lack of um, uh, alignment with international standards in terms of legal frameworks, and also lack of viable tools for um, for one within one part of the digital ecosystem, specifically the enabling environment and the role that regulators, the role that policymakers on antitrust issues or competition issues play in promoting the kinds of digital economies that we that we want to advance. And so, after uh, engaging in a range of consultations with uh, some service providers that work on the African continent, with civil society stakeholders that work on the continent, and and are steeped in these issues. Um, and other stakeholders, we developed an initiative that we ultimately launched with the Federal Trade Commission uh, to provide uh, capacity building and other types of assistance and collaboration with FTC counterparts across the continent. Um, you'll hear in a little bit uh, what uh, some of those specific interventions look like, but just to suffice it to say that um, through the engagement with the FTC, we're able to facilitate dialogue from peer to peer, the FTC engaging with its counterparts. I, I know that a couple um, uh, competition authority representatives are here in the webinar, which I'm really excited to see, and they could speak better to kind of the issues that they face, the institutional constraints that they face or challenges that they face when, when they are tasked with promoting or ensuring competition in the digital economy. Um, if you can move to the next slide, Musa, to implementation. Um, all right, so on, on implementation, something that we include in the, in the digital, uh, in, in the fair competition brief is three types of interventions. And these are illustrative. So everything that you end up supporting through the context of your work should be based on the context that you are in and the identi issues that you identify. However, what you see here are three sets of interventions or activities or engagements 
that reflect commonly identified or commonly encountered problems, specifically with, where, through a competition lens. Um, I won't talk uh, in depth about the, the first one, which focuses on uh, enabling environment-oriented interventions, because you'll hear in a moment from the FTC colleagues uh, what they're doing at that level. Um, but um, the other two focus on other aspects of the digital ecosystem. Um, so, as I said, one focuses on enabling environment. The second set focuses on working within the marketplace or working with marketplace actors. Uh, many development programs focus on facilitating uh, or mobilizing capital, uh, making sure that startups or entrepreneurs have the financial resources they need in order to grow and mount a competitive product uh, uh, in the marketplace. Sometimes we do that thinking more just in terms of, hey, we want to promote innovation. And a lot of times innovation comes from startups or from, from budding entrepreneurs. But something that we forget is that that also can be an uh, a, a very constructive way to stimulate new competition. That's really what is providing not just an incentive for that startup to offer new products, better products, but also stimulates an incentive for the other competitors already in the market to step up their game. The third set of interventions uh, or, or illustrative engagements that we offer focus more on civil society, you know, watchdog groups. These, these stakeholders, sometimes as these are academics doing independent research, sometimes these are NGOs at the, at the local level that, um, that uh, represent the interests of consumers. These stakeholders are critical and they often are overlooked when it comes to promoting uh, marketplace incentives for, for fair competition. They're critical because they have an institutional mandate typically to to fulfill their role as watchdogs, to, to try to identify problems in the marketplace that might have unintended negative consequences, or to engage with policymakers or regulators to ensure that the regulators are effectively fulfilling their mandates. Um, they're also a great source of uh, you know, unbiased information regarding what the marketplace is, is experiencing, how it's evolving, uh, or how end users are interacting with the marketplace. Um, something that I, I should mention also uh, before I before I go on is that markets are dynamic; they're not static. Musa mentioned this earlier as well. One reason why we encourage folks to always take a systems lens to understanding how to engage and develop programs in this market in this context is because markets are constantly evolving. Um, Musa mentioned earlier the M-Pesa example in Kenya. M-Pesa did not begin as a monolith. It ultimately developed uh, market power through a lot of investment, through its own set of innovations earlier on, through its um, uh, effective uh, extension of the market power of Safaricom in the telecom space. And uh, initially, it was the new kid on the block. And so what you think what you observe now in, a, in the marketplace might not necessarily be an issue. Uh, maybe it's something, maybe you uh, conclude that the competitive dynamics in your marketplace are sufficient now to not warrant significant attention, but it's worth revisiting that periodically in a couple of years. If quality of services start to get worse, if more and more consumers are reporting challenges with service providers, or if um, uh, issues, as I mentioned about algorithmic bias come up, then that might suggest there's something for you to, to look into. Um, let's see here. Uh, I know, uh, we have some, uh, some distinguished guests here, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say that, um, while some of you might be focused specifically on competition issues, maybe that's your technical expertise, um, for those of you who are not, just recall that this is a this is an area in which you, through your programming, can actually play a, a, an important and constructive role. Um, so if you uh, if you uh, don't think it's relevant, um, you can I encourage you to read the brief, and you'll see a few examples in there that explain um, uh, how this can tie to other development objectives that that uh, you might actually be focused more on. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to Rebecca. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. 
Um, please do go ahead and put any questions or comments on this presentation into the chat and we'll we'll address them at the end. Um, and I also see that a link to the technical brief has been added to the chat so folks can access it. Um, let's turn now to Wangombe Kariuki uh, to give us some perspectives from Africa and his experience working in, in, in Kenya and other parts of the region. Um, Wangombe is the recent is the author of a recently published article um, called Africa, the need for a new competition policy approach in digital economies. Uh, Wangombe, over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for uh, having me. Uh, what I'm going to share with the participants today, it's informed by work I've done with my colleague, Rafe Meza, which, as Rebecca has indicated, has been published recently in Concurrences. And uh, segueing from Paul's and Musa's uh, presentation, which has highlighted what I may call the sky blue uh, uh, work they are doing in regard to the intervention they are undertaking across the whole world, supporting the emerging economies and the emerging uh, uh, regulatory agencies to regulate digital economy. Our work, we focus on the African continent and uh, we have uh, tried to dissect the unique challenges the African competition regulators are facing in balancing the opportunities and the risks, you know, presented by the digital economy. And to do this is that uh, uh, I will start by highlighting uh, in the next slide the current uh, development of competition law in Africa. And we realized that over the last 15 years, there has been much progress. And this progress has been there based on the promulgation of new uh, laws and also institutional uh, dispensations, both at national level and regional level. Uh, at national level, we have seen development of 41 laws promulgated. And then at uh, regional level, we have COMISA, we have uh, YEMU, and we have ECOWAS. But having said that, is that when you look at the topography, I might say it's a bit ragged. And why I've decided to share this, it's in terms of the interventions which you said is undertaking to support digital regulation. I think it's important to appreciate this the, 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 the topography, because in terms of interventions, they may vary depending on the age or maturity of the competition agency. And in Africa is that you realize that we have four categories. I've identified four categories. One, it's operational and fully functional competition agencies. Uh, and these are the ones which are what I may call modern competition agencies, uh, modern competition laws, they are supported very well with a budget, and based on this is that be, they have been able to populate their, 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 their institutions with right skills. And then we have others which are operational, but not yet fully functional. And this is where we have uh, uh, competition agencies, especially at inter regional economic communities level. East African community has been there, the law has been there since 2006 but it has not been able to operationalize due maybe to lack of funds and also lack of skills to populate the organization. And then we have competition laws in place, but not operational agencies. Is uh, We have countries like Uganda, which promulgated their competition law just one month ago, and they are trying to operationalize the agency. And then we have others who are who are, who are developing their competition laws. And uh, like, for example, Burundi, and also I'm aware that South Sudan is in the process of seeking for partners to help them promulgate their competition law. In the next slide is that uh, we are going to, to review, you know, in terms of the benefits the digital economy offer to the African economies. One thing I have to be very clear is that the digital economy in Africa, they are more transformative rather than convenience, you know, offering convenience. And there's usually the challenge I find with that there's no size shoe which fits all 
is that we have to learn from the north, but we but the regulators have to domesticate appreciating the opportunities where the which the digital economy is serving. Uh, Paul and Musa they highlighted the Safaricom, the Impesa, and looking at where Impesas you know took Kenyans from in terms of money transfers, where we used to send money using the public service vehicles, and then now we are sending money money using our fingers. So this is how you find that it has expanded the consumer's choice. And also linking decentralized customers with decentralized producers. You know, some years ago is that you find that uh, when it came to like, for example, the taxi industry in Kenya, if you used to use the yellow taxis, you are considered to be, you know, a very rich person. But with the coming in of the taxi hailing companies like, uh, you know, Uber and others, is that we have seen that the consumer and also the demographics using the taxis is that it has expanded. Also in terms of reducing transaction costs, both when you are searching for something online and also when you want to procure in terms of, you know, comparing the, the, the prices. The other issue is that uh, also digital uh, economies help us to generate use for data, uh, which we can leverage in terms of marketplace. If I want to book a hotel now, I'll go to the booking.com and I'll check how it has been rated. Although there are challenges where the AI is generating some AI, some reviews, but that is something which has really helped the consumer. And then there's all also increasing opportunities for market entry, the startups. They don't need to have brick and mortar, which is very expensive and also connecting loose value chains. When I talk about connecting loose value chains, I usually, try, I usually share my exp example when I was young. I come from an area where we, we grow wheat and uh, we use combined harvesters to harvest. Uh, when I was young is that my mother used always to tell me to follow up where the, the combined harvester is so that they can come and harvest in our, in our farm. But these days is that we have some apps where you can just book the combined harvester and it shows clearly where you, where, what time it will come and where it is. Uh, having said that, in the next slide, of course, is that we have shown the rosy picture, but in the next slide is that there are some risks which are posed by the, uh, by the platforms and the digital economy. And I've categorized them both exogenous and also endogenous. And starting with the exogenous, there's something which has really been talked about in, in the previous presentation. It is increasing risks to competition, the tipping effect. Uh, 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 and I can highly uh, share about the mobile payments in, in Kenya, where it has tipped towards one, you know, one, one player. I know there has been some interventions in regard to interoperability but also it has been challenging on how to interoperate it. Then the other challenge it's in regard to, and this was also highlighted, the financial and political and resources and, and the, the financial power of the platforms. It, it is interesting to note that uh, the, the Apple, uh, Apple's capitalization is 3.27 trillion US dollars. And the African continent under the Afri ACFTA GDP you'll guess it's 3.4 trillion. So Apple's capitalization is somehow the same as the SCFTA GDP at 3.4 trillion. So is that it's the right time that the African countries clearly uh, come up with what I may say a critical mass to be able to regulate these platforms. The other challenge we are having, it's non-convergence of approaches internationally. I know when it started, Europe, there was what I may call cross-Atlantic tensions. Europe was the trailblazer. There was challenges in regard to where, when, where to, how, and how, and when to regulate. But at least that cross-Atlantic tension, I'm seeing it's being, the chasm is being eliminated. But, uh, but that, the, the, the challenge is that, as I indicated earlier, that there's no one size shoe which fits all. And the challenge with this is that the African regulators have no place to call best international practice. Let's move to the endogenous uh, risks in the next slide. 
these are the risks which are inherent within the cooperation agencies. The greatest challenge I realized is that in regulation of the digital economy and platforms is that they have more cooperation agencies are being faced with unfamiliar territories, moving from the usual economic framework, the theory of harm, and moving to the, to the fairness concept, which I may say it's usually very difficult to create the beacons of what is fairness. It's very subjective. And therefore, it's not only challenging to the regulators, but also it's challenging to the regulated because it may affect regulation based on the whims and caprice of the people in power as regulators. The other area is lack of effective regulatory regimes and skills and budgetary constraint to manage the risks. As our first slide indicated clearly, is that it is quite an uneven topography and it's uneven also because of lack of skills to regulate the traditional economies and now there's a totally different uh, landscape to regulate where it requires a lot of <clears throat> a lot of intervention in, in developing new areas the, 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 the other areas, it's also that we don't have commonality approach within the cooperation agency, within the regulators, that is the sectoral regulators and the cooperation agencies at national level. And this kind of disparate approaches does not have, uh, it does not augur well for having optimal decisions to support growth or to minimize risks of the digital economy. Next slide, please. Uh, 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 and this situation now forms what I may call a regulatory conundrum where the regulators are facing in Africa. And the biggest challenge is, is that how do they balance the benefits as we highlighted and the risks without overlooking the other one? And then also it's in terms of priority setting. Do, we, do they focus on the traditional markets? or the digital economy, which even the policymakers are not appreciating. But what I've been telling them is that they need to show how digital economies are also supporting the traditional economies to progress for the betterment of our citizenry. Then the other conundrum, it's the approach. Do they go for hard enforcement? That is investigations, administrative investigations, or they go for soft enforcement in terms of market inquiries. Then the other challenge, the conundrum they are facing, it's the regulatory tools in terms of do they use the dominance provisions within their laws or enacting new provisions which have realized they are thinking of enacting abuse of superior bargaining positions and, reg and uh, regulating economic dependence. Next, <clears throat> next slide, please. In the next slide, I've tried to show how the old and the new, how the old, the traditional ways, the way regulators used to regulate competition and how now they are supposed to regulate the digital economy. We have moved from bilateral relationship of firms, firm A and firm B, to what I may call multilateral. That is kind of an ecosystem of looking at issues. Then we have moved from what I'm calling consumer welfare laws, the theory of harm, to fairness criteria. All these, as highlighted in that slide, they are quite new to regulators and they need to shift their mindset from the past to the new one. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> and uh, all is not lost. African continental free trade area presents policy powers to address competition risks in digital economy. And uh, what I may highlight the competition e e protocol under the African continental free trade area Article 11 is very clear. It has endeavored to regulate gatekeeping and economic dependence. And what we did with RAFE is that we segregated all what has been highlighted, the nine uh, risks to three. That is the terms of service or usage and favoring of farms or services and use of data. Rebecca, I think after this, you can share the, 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 the slides. So I don't need to go to specifics, but when we look at this, is this what they are 
<clears throat> they are supposed is supposed to be regulated under Article 11. Let's go to the next slide, please. Next slide. But, but, but also is that, uh, no, the, the previous one. Yeah, but also to prioritize the uh, operationalization of ACFTA under Article 11 is that what we identified after talking to the policymakers in Africa and, and regulators is that we identified four policy areas which they need to focus on. And, and one of you know, importance, it's in terms of market definition and mergers threshold uh, setting because they have to move from the traditional metrics of set or of defining markets to and also setting the thresholds. The other area it's self-preferencing in digital services. They, are, they highlighted that they need to develop a list of most consequential self-preferencing behaviors and determine what appropriate policy response may be. And then, as I highlighted, it's whether hard enforcement or soft enforcement. And we're very clear that market inquiry collaboration and peer learning exchanges is the most appropriate and prioritized route of regulating digital economy. And also data is of importance, how they collect the data and analyze it, they'll determine how they'll reach optimal decisions to conduct or rather to regulate digital platform. Next slide, please. And Wangome, I'm so sorry to jump in and interrupt. Um, if we could maybe wrap up on this slide and then we can save the rest for the discussion, if that's okay. Apologies. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, you. the the regulators have identified market inquiries, which I'm, I'm calling soft enforcement, as a key thing in, in regulating digital economy. It's because already they have the competent regulatory legal capacity that most of them across Africa, they are at a capacity to do marketing to, to conduct market inquiry number two is that and i uh, paul mentioned this it's the dynamism in these markets hard investigations take about three years to finalize but in terms of market inquiries there's an average of one year then the presence of government induced competition obstacles you don't investigate the government but you advise the government through market inquiries is that you can be able to uh, advise the government then of also high risk of judicial challenges and the, the, the hard enforcement. We regulators, they don't have the capacity to you know, hire the best lawyers, but as highlighted is that the platforms, they have the best, all the resources. Then there's lack of obvious internal skills to regulate digital economy and also non-convergence of approaches internationally, non-existence of international best practice that they cannot relate to. So as they conduct market inquiry, they will appreciate how their markets work and decide on the best optimal regulatory intervention to deal with digital economy. I think the others we can, we can discuss in our Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And with your permission, we can also share the full slide deck with participants um, if they're interested. So let me uh, turn it over to Molly um, to round out the conversation with perspective from the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Um, Molly is a counsel for international antitrust at the FTC. Molly, over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. And thanks to all the others um, who've already spoken today that make uh, this wrap up easier for me since you've covered so many of the essential points. Um, I do want to zoom out a little bit just in terms of covering what a competition authority does. Um, and the Federal Trade Commission is one of two competition authorities within the U.S. We share antitrust enforcement, which I'll use as a synonym for competition, um, with the Department of Justice. Uh, I do need to add a disclaimer that the views I share today are my own and not necessarily those of my agency, the Federal Trade Commission, or any individual commissioner. So looking at what an agency like the FTC does is it has a competition role, but also has a consumer protection and a data privacy role. Um, our mission is to protect the public from deceptive or unfair business practices and from unfair methods of competition. And we use many of the tools that we heard other speakers today, Wang Gombe in particular, discuss, and that is law enforcement, which Wang Gombe was referring to as hard enforcement. So we're conducting a, an investigation using our legal authority to do that 
whether that's competition, consumer protection, or privacy. Um, there's also soft enforcement, which um, Juan Gombe referred to. And to me, that would include things like advocacy, so reaching out to other parts of government and other stakeholders, whether that's business or NGOs, to understand emerging issues and to promote awareness of the competition, consumer protection, or, or privacy law. Um, also conducting research um, and an education role for businesses as well. So an important part of this for agencies, and some of our sister agencies across Africa have a dual mission similar to FTC, so they're both enforcing consumer protection and competition law, um, and some don't. So sometimes our stakeholders, are, are our counterpart agencies are, are uh, specific to the type of law they're enforcing and not a, a joint authority like FTC. So what we're engaged in with any of those partner agencies really together, but with stakeholders across our own government, other important stakeholders like NGOs, um, industry representatives, academia that we heard about as well, um, is really developing the expertise and the understanding of how to assess emerging business practices and changes in an economy. Um, and that's always been true. So the FTC is a little over 100 years old, about 110. Um, and we have had that since the start. So there would have been innovations even in back in 1914, um, whether or not that was, you know, the, the switch from horses to uh, motorized vehicles, which was really active and, and debated a lot then. Um, that moved on to the evolution of radio, um, evolution of the internet, evolution of uh, mobile phones and smart devices that we see now. And each of those has had really its own effect of revolutionizing the way commerce was conducted, the way consumers engaged in an economy, and really transformed many aspects of life. So throughout that period, the competition agency and experts within the FTC have always needed to stay up on what those emerging uh, sectors are as well as the effects and the way that business practices could affect consumers. So how have we engaged within that um, developing the expertise and the horizon scanning that's necessary? One very recent example um, that we at the FTC acknowledged was something that we could develop uh, more specifically was through creating an office of technology. Um, which we formed about two years ago. We've now renamed it the Office of Technology Research and Investigation. And again, that's reflecting the role that technology and the role that this office plays in both our policy work and our investigations and our law enforcement work. So really when we think of a competition authority or consumer protection authority, in the position. So it's an agency that's specialized in those fields and needs to apply its mission across a really diverse range of industries, whether that's tech or whether that's agriculture or whether that's the, the overlap of the two. We're seeing tech affect agricultural markets. How do we understand that um, from the government agency perspective? Um, first, a lot of the harms that we might see arising in a marketplace, whether that's a consumer harm, um, a harm to competition, um, is going to be applying across industry. So that expertise that a competition authority has developed is going to apply, and a lot of the same skills, really foundational skills in how do we conduct an investigation, how do we identify the right stakeholders, whether we're engaged in a policy or research effort or we're engaged in a law enforcement investigation? How do we know we're talking to the right experts and the right people outside of our agency? Also, when we're accepting that information in, how are we able within our legal mandate to use that information to help inform the FTC's policy work and other priorities in law enforcement? So one is that the FTC has supplemented our own resources. Um, we coordinate with other government agencies. We try to draw on the expertise and ask questions of a standard setting organization or of a, a business participant, a new entrant, um, the people that are creating those startup companies, uh, understanding their perspective and are they encountering barriers, either the conduct by another company 
or is there a regulatory structure in place that's really preventing a startup from being founded or preventing a startup from growing? And is that a barrier that has a strong anti-competitive effect without a counterbalancing uh, other policy effect, which could be you know, health and safety or um, promoting uh, access to finance or things? There are definitely trade-offs in the space, but how as we as a competition or consumer protection or privacy authority have that conversation with many stakeholders to say, you know, here's how this policy choice might limit competition, or here's how this policy choice might limit or might promote consumer protection. How do we keep that in mind while we're balancing other important policy considerations? So one thing that we did um, with the Office of Technology is reach out to our counterpart agencies across the world. And I'm so happy to see many of those agencies we've worked with today um, here on the call. And what we wanted to understand was how do we harness that expertise and make the benefit of say one investigation or the experience that the Competition Authority Kenya had in competition and financial markets how do we facilitate that discussion so we can understand if we're seeing a similar issue within the US economy? Or the opposite is true. How does use of data that we've seen and the extent of use of mobile phones have an impact on consumer protection or competition as other countries are seeing great increases in that type of, um, of commerce? So within those discussions um, that our Office of Technology staff was having with competition authorities and consumer protection authorities around the world, um, we took those conversations um, and conversations with many stakeholders across the US government and distilled some best practices in how we've built the technological capacity um, as a law enforcement agency. So one is recognizing the need, um, the need that exists to keep ourselves informed, and also recognizing that technology is very, very broad. So as we're doing this, we're going to have to address things like changes in infrastructure. What are the technologies or even you know, physical goods or, or services provided that are underlying the infrastructure necessary for the ways in which uh, economies are digitizing and communications are happening and transactions are happening with phones. We'll also have to identify things like algorithms, things we've heard today, like AI. How are those business models operating? And how does that affect data collection, data use, the practices businesses are using, the behavior of companies? How is that affecting opportunities for innovation, for product quality? Is that a way that companies are leveraging those to be pro-competitive or is it in fact applied in a way that's limiting competition? So those are the things that we, as those experts are trying to understand even in something as broad as the digital economy. The next key practice is really that we want to be taking timely action so we want to be positioning ourselves to detect a consumer harm or an anti-competitive practice and to target those before they're widely adopted, as well as assessing the market conditions that could lead markets to tip. And we heard that um, from Wangombe identified as well. So what that lets us do is be in a position really to limit harm. And we in the same goal, we have the same goal as the competition authority in the US as most of our sister agencies abroad. So remembering that we have that in common is quite important, but that keeps us in touch and lets us share experiences um, and benefit from each other's uh, expertise as well. The other key practice that we've found is really that it takes interdisciplinary coordination and that takes um, legal perspectives, technology disciplines, economic experts, and teams working together that approach cases, research, and other policy tools that competition and consumer protection and privacy authorities have. So I'll take one example of this type of cross-agency, intra-agency, intra-governmental, and private sector stakeholder um, coordination. Um, and that is on the government side, what the US has had in place for a few years now, which is a whole of government approach to competition. And through that, we've really tried to 
include competition on the agenda of many other agencies across the government and have more regular discussions and communications about emerging business practices about the effects of technology. One example of that is uh, in the technology space relates to AI. And that's a January 2024 meeting that was held at the White House um, on competition policy and artificial intelligence. And that was a listening session that brought together government stakeholders, as well as industry, academia, and NGOs who were able to share their experiences in the AI space in particular to help us spot issues and to help us stay informed as business practices emerge. So that allows us to strengthen our horizon scanning, um, just as an example. And what we've seen in the international uh, cooperation space, and that leads me to the trust and competition program that FTC and USAID are engaged in, um, is really leveraging the relationships the FTC has had for some, in some cases, decades, like we see today colleagues from the Competition Commission of South Africa, as well as colleagues from COMESA, the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa's Competition Commission, as well as Competition Authority Kenya and others um, who have been our key partners. And through that engagement, particular to the digital economy, but also looking at what are those foundational skills that let a competition authority tackle those law enforcement investigations or use those policy tools through research, market studies, stakeholder engagement to keep itself informed and to keep awareness of emerging issues and the awareness of the importance of competition and consumer protection alive across an economy. So one example um, of a the capacity building and experience sharing is the FTC's collaboration and engagement with the COMESA Competition Commission through a series of workshops. And both last year and this year, we've had joint workshops that include both consumer protection and competition tracks, um, looking at um, investigative skills, looking at how do we identify um, the ways that we can use our agency's tools to tackle um, theories of harm, identify theories of harm, and apply those in law enforcement investigations. Last year, we had a five-day workshop with about 90 participants from 18 countries. And next week, my FTC colleague, colleagues um, and others from about 25 jurisdictions across Africa um, with over 100 attendees to really focus on developing those investigative skills that's going to help take on a digital economy case, but also take on any type of competition or consumer protection issue that agencies are identifying. Another broad category of engagement is engagements with our experienced sister agencies on digital policy and enforcement work. And that has included senior official and agency head policy engagement. We, together with the Competition Commission of South Africa last, last fall in September, um, who's spring there, fall here, um, joined together with Federal Trade Commission and DOJ, as well as competition authorities um, that we see joining us on the call today from Kenya, from South Africa, from COMESA, and several other jurisdictions, um, to talk through our experiences and challenges as we've brought digital cases, as we've, we've seen things evolve in the uh, industries we've heard about already, how has ride sharing or delivery services that are app enabled uh, evolved in what have been competition concerns or consumer protection concerns identified. Um, same with things we see with finance or banking and the way that digital transactions are affecting those industries. This high level discussion also included agency heads, as I mentioned. Um, so also last October, our FTC chair was able to meet with the heads of nine competition authorities across Africa to have these discussions at an even more in-depth level. So how are we you know, using our Office of Technology? How are other agencies employing experts and benefiting from the knowledge gained, for example, through Competition Commission of South Africa's market inquiries into online intermediation platforms? Um, it's really helpful to, to have that baseline. Um, and even as Francis mentioned that we don't yet have best practices in this particular area, the experience sharing is really the first step um, on a, a path that could lead to developing those, but at minimum is making sure that we have the communication and we're able to learn effectively from each other. The other two, because I know we're a little bit uh, tight on time here, are fellowships. So one key part of the trust and competition in digital economies 
ex engagement um, is the FTC can bring on staff who are employed at other competition or consumer protection or data privacy authorities. And they can come to work at the FTC and be embedded within the actual teams conducting investigations or engaging in policy work. Um, we've hosted one um, fellow from the Comesa Competition Commission who worked in an FTC merger division, so within our competition um, group for three months, who was able to gain firsthand experience with the practices and the investigation tools and skills that we apply at the FTC um, in merger matters, both in the digital and outside of the digital economy. We're also currently hosting a fellow from Nigeria's Data Protection Commission who's working within an FTC division that's focused on privacy issues and privacy related investigations. And finally, the category I'd like to highlight is experience sharing um, international organization collaborations and our ability at the FTC to offer our own experience in reviewing either pending laws or regulations or internal practices that another sister agency or, or government is considering in the competition privacy or consumer protection space. An example of there is a workshop that was held in November of 2023 as part of the Southern African Development Community or SADX Consumer Protection Group um, that was hosted with Namibia's Ministry of Industrialization and Trade. And there we were engaged really with two goals. One um, was to promote the coordination and collaboration among uh, SADC member states with cross-border and digital consumer protection matters and also to provide feedback on the um, pending legislation within the Namibian government. And on that track, a final note I'll add is that we are able to, as a dual mission agency, also work with governments that are you know, at the point of considering, should there be separate entities? Should there be a competition agency that's separate from a consumer protection agency, or does it make sense um, to join them together. And there are different models we see of, of those on the call today. For example, South Africa has two, um, a consumer protection and a competition, but they're in touch, they're in communication when there are issues overlapping. Um, that's important. So even though there are separate agencies to maintain those lines of communication, um, other agencies we see today like consumer uh, or the Competition Authority of Kenya um, is consumer protection and competition. Same with the Comesa Competition Commission. So we really look forward to future engagements um, through this through this program. And I really want to thank um, all of our key partners for joining us today on this call. Over to you, Rebecca. Great. Right, thank you so much, Molly. And apologies to all of the panelists for rushing them through their their comments. Um, but I wanted to make sure that folks had a chance to engage more during the QA. Could I ask um, all of the panelists to please turn your camera back on? Um, recognizing that we're over the hour, for those who can stay, I'd love to invite folks to add questions um, in, in the chat. Um, and I might just start with one question that, that touches uh, on, Molly, something that you were just speaking about uh, related to international organizations. So there was a question about how international organizations can support um, developing countries and sanctioning big tech companies um, and what would be appropriate remedies for, for developing countries. Um, so I'm not sure who, who's best suited to respond to that, but feel free to jump in. Um, Paul, Musa, Molly, Wangobe, do you have any thoughts about that? Sure, I can, I can kick it off. Um, I, that's, I think, a, a really key issue um, that authorities around the world are, are grappling with. Um, and I did see Wangome mentioned the sort of is ex ante better. So do we take um, action at, at the outset to, to maybe put some some limitations on or some curbs or some some guidelines um, that companies would follow regards regarding certain behavior to either continue to promote competition or to promote uh, consumer protection? Um, and, and same, I think there's a, another choice in what we've seen typically with law enforcement, when you bring a case and you're presenting it to a judge, you're really identifying harm that's already occurred, um, which is an example of that type of ex post remedy. Um, so it's something that's going to be very dependent on the type of harm you're identifying, whether that's something specific, maybe just to the way one company is behaving, or whether you, as you're doing horizon scanning and engaging with stakeholders, are identifying, no, it's not really just this one company, and then in instance, then their behavior is violating competition law, but it's a practice that's being much more widely adopted. 
Um, and I think that can help inform the type of remedy that you would like to put in place from the perspective of a competition authority or consumer protection authority. I'm interested to hear others' views as well. I think the other area they can really support, and uh, I mentioned about uh, FTC coming up with data technologies. Uh, cooperation agencies in the part of the world I come from, they can't afford such kind of people. And I think across the world, they can share resources in terms of the areas where it's expensive to maintain such resources. And uh, also what FTC is doing, that creating awareness and building that capacity. And uh, we can have also international cooperations where we can have waivers of sharing information. I think those are the areas they can collaborate in. Thank you. Um, I have a question actually, as you know, uh, somebody who looks at this with more of a development hat on, I didn't realize uh, until I was prepping for this that I think everybody on the panel is actually a lawyer by training. Um, not. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, pleasantly surprised to, to see that, but for those of us who are working on this topic, who are not lawyers, you know, how, how should we be thinking about approaching this? Um, you know, I think it, it might, um, the tendency might, might be to shy away from some of these topics if, if folks don't have that, that, that legal background or that training. So what advice would you give to folks, I guess at USA or other organizations, um, who, who want to talk, work on these topics? Paul, I see your hand up. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to take this. I would say absolutely diverse perspectives are necessary because uh, everyone has blind spots of one form or another. And if you are a regulator or an enforcement agency, if you're a lawyer in one of those entities, um, your ability to effectively fulfill your mandate is based on your understanding of how the marketplace is evolving on the ground. That means it's important for you to understand what do consumers say? What do small businesses experience when they're interacting with their competitors? Um, and then it may, raises the question of where do we get that kind of information? Uh, in many cases, you get that information from academics. In other cases, you get that information from uh, you know, technologists, people within industry. Um, sometimes you get it from ethicists. You know, there's everyone has a different, uh, you know, role to play in in uh, resolving blind spots, just strictly thinking about it from an information perspective. The other thing that I think is really important to highlight, which I should have mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I mentioned that the marketplace is complex and dynamic. Because it's complex, that means that typically more than one specific intervention or engagement or activity is necessary to promote the kinds of development outcomes that we want to see. So it's not simply a function of what role regulators or enforcement agencies have to play to promote fair competition. It's also often uh, a function of what you are doing in other parts of the marketplace if you're a development agency. So that means, uh, you know, grant making, working with startups or build, uh, providing uh, capacity building or training uh, assistance to uh, industry actors on how to deploy more responsible business practices. Um, usually because these, the marketplace is complex enough that it's necessary to do multiple things in order to stimulate the kind of systemic change that you want, which means you're working with different kinds of people, not just lawyers, sometimes lawyers, Sometimes statisticians, sometimes uh, you know uh, people that that have other roles in the marketplace. Yeah, Wang Gombe, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to share on that po point of Paul, in regard to all the interventions the Cooperation Authority of Kenya did, it was through market inquiries, and these market inquiries they were not conducted by the Competition authority, but researchers high, uh, hired, you know, brought on board and then they build internal capacity. Then the other area is that uh, uh, also as Paul has indicated, it's more of a collaborative approach and it's not collaborative approach just depending on the disciplines, but also collaborated approach depending also with the regulated because let not regulators indicate that they know everything. 
there are some of the things that they need to be explained to. They don't appreciate how AI works, but they need to be explained. It. So there's a need of bringing on board uh, what I may call explainability rules, you know, so that the regulated can come and explain for the, regulated to, the regulators to appreciate the challenges, and then they can come up with the optimal decisions. That, that's so important. Um, Molly. I was just going to say, I think we already are experts uh, in this, regardless of our status as lawyers or not, but as consumers. Um, and this is really an area where it is, I think, easy to see, you know, what's happening in a marketplace. Do you think things, you have the right information available to you to make an informed choice about a product? Are things so limited that you don't have a choice? Those are things that we've all encountered just as, as, as consumers, and those are really the, the foundations of, of the experience and what competition and consumer protection and privacy law are about. So I think just draw on, feel confident in the expertise you already have. Uh, because you're a key player and a key stakeholder in these areas already. That's great. No, and that's a fantastic note, I think, to close on. And I want to thank everyone who's stayed with us through um, through the presentations and, and the Q&A. Um, you know, I think we've heard uh, that collaboration is is key for, um, for us to make progress on these issues. So please do reach out, um, you know, if there is an interest or opportunity to collaborate with any of the speakers on this team, um, around this panel, uh, USAID, FTC, um, with Juan Gombe and his team. Um, we're happy to put you in touch. Uh, and I think um, I will end it there. But again, thanks uh, for joining us and, and thanks for your questions and, and active participation. That's it. All right. Wonderful. Have a wonderful Thank you, everyone. Day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks.